and welcome to Faculty Spotlight. I'm Ginny Haran, and today I get to interview the multi-talented George Tavalia. Hi, Ginny. Hi, George. Thanks for coming back. Oh, it's great to be here. I have so many things I want to ask you. One of them is a story I heard because I was at your retirement dinner, but I don't think a lot of people understand how you got to be here in your early days and your journey. So I was wondering if you could tell us that story. Oh, sure. What most people don't, don't, know, don't know about me is before I came to Suffolk, I drove a lumber truck for a small lumber company in Bayport. Uh, it was, at the time, it was a great job. Right, when uh, you're young. Yeah, it was a great job. I was making good money. Um, and then uh, I was drafted while I was there. Went into, the, went, went into the Army. Did a short stint in the Army. And then when I came out, I went back to work at the uh, lumber yard, where I was getting all sorts of promises by the boss to move up and do this right. and do that. And I soon realized that they were kind of vacant uh, promises. So wasn't going to happen. Wasn't going to happen. Um, so I remember turning to uh, my wife at the time, who uh, was in the laundromat. And I said to her, Nancy, I need to go to college. We're getting nowhere. And we need to start thinking about the future. Um, and uh, she, she was uh, supportive right away. Because she was now going to have to go to work. She, yeah, I needed, to, I needed her to get full-time employment uh, so I can go to school full-time because I wanted to bang out my associate's degree as right. fast as possible right. so I can get a better job. So I went to uh, Suffolk County Community College and enrolled in the uh, Marine Science Program. And the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> But talk a little bit more about that, because now you're going to school full-time, but you also were working. Well, I went to school full-time, and uh, in the evenings I worked full-time as a custodian. Wow. Um, and that's why I had such a great appreciation for the custodians in our buildings. Exactly. Because I knew exactly the job. I mean, I could polish the floors just as well as they could polish the floors. It just reminds me of that movie Good Will Hunting, like you're in the college, but not quite where you want to be yet. Um, well, I wish I was just as successful. <laughs> <laughs> well, that movie ended ambiguously. We don't know how that ended up, but we know how you ended up. So what happened next? You got the so, associates. So, so I uh, went, went to uh, Suffolk, got the associates, associate's degree, and at the time they were promising us all sorts of jobs in marine sciences, and there really were very few. Uh, I would think. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. So I got a job offers from three places, Brookhaven National Laboratory, uh, Stony Brook University, and Suffolk County Community College. Now, the jobs at the, uh, the lab and Stony Brook were all grant-related jobs, so all they can guarantee was one year. Right. When the grant runs out, the right. job is gone. Correct. And they call that, you said, soft money? So, well, I called it soft you money. You called it soft money, I which it soft money. we weren't interested yeah. in soft yeah. money. <laughs> uh, and I wasn't interested because at the, at the time, my wife was pregnant with our first child. Okay. And so I needed something a little more permanent. I can imagine. So I selected uh, Suffolk County Community College. And, and you were? And it was a great, great selection. Well, what were you doing exactly? You were working in the labs at, here? At, at Suffolk? Yeah. As what was your first job? My first job was a technical assistant in the biology department. And I ran the microbiology labs for wow. 18 years. Wow. Um, it, was a, it was a big, big job. At the time, we had a contract with uh, a number of different hospitals for a nursing program. So I was running 22 micro labs a week. Was that strange, though, to now work side by side with the teachers well, you had? The had? hardest thing I, I, I had to do was transform myself from being a graduate in May of 1969 to a faculty member in, on September 1, 1969. And so the, the people who were my professors were now my colleagues. That's very it, it, odd. It was very awkward, uh, to say the least. Very, very Well, awkward. in your head, you're probably thinking, am I really here? Am I right. supposed to be right. here? But they were great. They were really great. They were very, very embracing and uh, uh, very kind. But obviously, that was not the end. You continued on. Well, I had a number of different positions at the okay. college. I went from technical assistant to senior technical assistant to instructor, assistant professor, associate professor, professor, assistant dean, associate dean, wow. interim executive dean. And, and all the while when you were back at, in your first position here, you were going for your bachelor's. Correct. I was um, taking advantage of something that the division chairman offered to me early on in my career, 
when I was first hired, um, Rick Paul, the division chairman, pulled me into his office and said, you know, I hope you're going to go on and get your bachelor's degree, and I will do everything to help you accomplish that. That's great. Um, so at the time, we had arrangements, the Suffolk Community College had arrangements with Stony Brook University for tuition waivers. Great. So every semester, I took two or three courses. While you uh, were being while, a dad, while you were... While I was working. Being a husband. And being a husband. Wow. In between work duties and evening duties and so forth. Running off, take a class, come back and do some work. And not sleeping, I would think. Uh, well, it was long hours. Yeah. Back then, when I was young, we, I, was, I would get to work at 7.30 in the morning. I didn't get home until 11 at night. Wow. And when did you study? Um, Any time in between. Any time in between. <laughs> Anytime in between. Yeah, grab the moment. Study as hard as you could. Get so you really get our students because they're doing. I very understand completely. Understand completely. My 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 associate's degree program was a seventy-two credit program. That's a lot. It was carrying twenty something credits each semester. It was it was a heavy load. And so it's I understand intense. fully what our students are going through. And I think that's what's made you such a great leader here. Um, I have given that list of jobs. I need to ask you a two-part question. Of that whole list, which job did you like the best? And because it's not necessarily the same thing, which job was the most challenging? That's easy. Um, job I liked the best was the interim executive dean job. Here, at Here, Grant. At, at the Grant campus. Uh, it was great because it, it gave me the opportunity to see the big picture, you know, how everything came together at, at, a, at a campus. Prior to that, all I was focused on was individual tasks that I was assigned to do. And now I needed to pay attention to how all those tasks came together to run a campus. And I equate it to being like a, um, a, a conductor of a great orchestra. Now a you, great orchestra. You, know, you, 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 <laughs> you have to know when to turn to the, the right part of the orchestra to, right. to get their contribution. So in the beginning, I would you know, turn to admissions and do everything I could do to help admissions get students into the right. college. You know, then turn to the registrar and see if the, what we can do to get those lines down and, and get the stress and strain. <laughs> the infamous lines, yeah. right. Help the registrar uh, staff. You know, how the counselors, how can I help the counselors you know, you know, get, them, uh, uh, get the students through that whole counseling session as fast as Plus possible. Plus keep it physically running. Yeah. There's that whole other piece Yeah, of the physical plan part was a, was a big issue. On, on any of our campuses. Mm, leaky huge roofs. And leaky roofs. And all that. Hot, cold, you know, oh, all, I, all the things. <laughs> the temperature. <laughs> yeah, the people complain That's about. That's a great analogy. Yeah. I think it's the perfect analogy. Yeah. Um, so that was the one you enjoyed. Which was the one that kept you awake at night? Hard, the hardest job was um, the assistant dean uh, at the Eastern campus. It was my first uh, job as, a, as an administrator. It was very hard for me initially because I moved from being the grievance officer of the faculty association, um, the union advocate, you know, the- For faculty. For faculty, the advocate for the faculty, to being an administrator. That's um, huge. You know, supervising faculty. It was, it was a dramatic change for me. It was right. very hard. Because they have two different, well, not vastly different, but you definitely have, have to have two different points of view yeah. when you switch. Yeah, and it takes a while to, at least for me, it took me a while to, to make that transformation. Did you feel disloyal almost to the yeah, faculty? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. I did. And until I really, really realized what my role is and you know, what's expected of me in this new role, you know, and then, then I was pretty firm in what I had to do. And yeah. it's not like it's two sides, two opposing sides. There's, they have more in common. Yeah, yeah. But not always. Not which always, is yeah. your, your next position I wanted to ask about. How long were you the grievance officer? 13 years. That is a long time dealing with conflict. Yes. Uh, what is that job like? It's the, in my opinion, it's the hardest job in the union. I would think. Because you're dealing with um, very large problems. It, it could be insignificant problems like, right. um, you know, somebody didn't get a class, you know, so you have to resolve that through the rules of seniority and just enforce those rules. But most of the time, it was not that. It was, you know, severe emotional problems mm -hmm. or some severe crisis that a faculty member is going through. Wow. So you had to learn how to be a real good listener to really find out what the real problem is. And weren't they able to just call you any time, day or night? They would call me 24 hours a day. I got many, many phone calls, you know, midnight and beyond. Venting. Venting for hours on the telephone. Wow. And... 
you know, it's, it's a job where you can't say, well, this is not the proper time to call me. Right. You know, they, they called because they were, you know, very, very upset. So you had to listen. It's, there's definitely an emotional component to that that I think makes it mm -hmm. more draining than mm -hmm. anything else. And, and you know, it's, it's draining for the grievance officer because um, you know, your job is to protect that faculty member. Right. And really, the only thing that protects the faculty member is the merits of the case. Right. But as, as the officer in charge, I always felt you know, the burden is on me. To prove. To prove, yeah. And then you had to do this total flip and be an administrator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that is difficult. Yeah, it's difficult. But um, thank God you did that uh, because... Well, what, one part of that job, though, that people don't realize is when you, when you first start, you become such a, a strong advocate for the faculty and for union principles right. that you always feel that the management side is always wrong in whatever right. they do. <laughs> But as you do the job longer and longer and longer, you realize that the gap between your view and management's view is getting closer and closer and closer. It's not as vast. It's not as gap. vast. So by the time I made the transition from grievance officer to um, to assistant dean, you know that gap had become very very small. And I was very lucky. I worked with some very very good uh, administrators. Uh, Steve Shire, for example, was a role model for me in terms of a person who knew the right thing to do. And was fair, and logical. And was fair and logical in That's the process. And, and he really taught me how, how, how important it was to be absolutely honest you know, through procedures. And, yeah. that, and that played a win. You know, you know, argue the merits right. of the case. Right, follow the rules. Follow the Let rules. Let the process work. Exactly right. Exactly right. Exactly right. And it's interesting that you said he, he kind of mentored you or he was a role model because really you saw early on that we had a real need here um, to have more leadership and have faculty get more involved in maybe some of the more administrative positions. So you worked very hard to establish the chair academy. So I was wondering if you could speak to that for a little bit, what you saw the need was and how you went about making that happen. Well, the, well, the need was to create a, a core of people that we could tap at any time to move into a, a leadership position. Because they weren't. And we needed to do that because there was a reluctance for people to make that commitment. Mm -hmm. And part of the, you know, the bigger reluctance was monetary. Right. Uh, because the, the guild salaries were larger than, and, than the exempt salaries at the time. And also the guild positions were protected by contractual rights and exempts were not protected by so contractual rights. So yeah. there's a lot of reasons why people were not moving in. Um, but I took the position that we really needed to develop our talent from within because the people that work here knew the organization much better than anybody coming from the outside. Exactly. And we also had a history here that where many people that came from the, the outside uh, for important positions didn't last very long. I've seen they, it. <laughs> they really did not learn the culture fast enough to survive. Right. So I wanted to build a training program that would provide uh, the participants with the skill set to succeed. So when they did finally get those positions, they could hit the ground running and not always try to figure out, you know, how do I play this game? Right. right? And it's been very successful. I mean, yeah. there are so many people who have come through it who are now moving into chair positions. I'm so proud of you know, this, this, this program. I'm very proud of the program. I think it's been critical because I'm a big believer in what you said, that when somebody comes from the outside, particularly if they're not from New York, mm -hmm. I feel like it's culture shock on your daily life, just living on Long Island, mm -hmm. and it's culture shock because you're not familiar with, right. with, this, with this college. Um, now, with such a long and successful career, I have to ask you this because you are always initiating things um, and volunteering for things. And we also teach a lot and we have a lot of students. So how did you stay motivated? Because you hear about burnout. Like, how did you stay so motivated when you hit obstacles or things were taking a long time to happen and just keep coming back? I mean, you're teaching now. You're retired. You're still mm -hmm. teaching. You're still connected. What's the secret? I just like to get things done. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if there is a secret. Um, you know, I was very fortunate that I, I had um, very good a very good network of, of people that I work with who trusted me mm -hmm. over the years, and, and trust is very important. 
Um, and so when I came up with uh, new ideas, I would bounce them off of people. And you know, I'd, I'd survey you know, whether I'd, I'd get the support or not. Right. If I saw some interest, I'd pursue it further and a little bit more aggressively. Mm -hmm. And you know, from the network I had, I was getting more and more support for the initiatives I was creating. Um, and, and that, that helped me, you know, that, that gave, gave me the drive to But that's to keep a special pushing. quality. There are a lot of people who would have the same thing and they just say, no, I'm not, it, I'm, it's not worth it. I'm not gonna do it. And yet you've always done it. And I guess what the reward has been seeing the results. Yeah, yeah I, I just enjoy you know, starting a project and, and watching it mature. And then you know, once I get to a certain point with the project, like the Excelsior program, when I get right. to a, a certain point with something, uh, I wanna move on to something new. But you've left so, a legacy so, so here. I, so I let go and give it to somebody else. And, right. and, I, and I always tell them that your, your job is to move this program now to the next level you know, and make it better. I and so I challenge them. And, and, and the, you know, the beauty, uh, Jenny, is that they always come up to the challenge. You know, for, for example, the Excelsior program, I handed that off to Deborah Wolfson. And she made it a much more organized program and added a lot more detail to it you know, to give it the strength that it needed to survive, and the program has blossomed. See, I think you're an optimist. <laughs> you must be a fundamental optimist, because that's what you need. You need to just keep believing and keep going. Well, that um, program started with, uh, I think, our, initially we had like 19 students in the program. Wow. Now we have over 2,500 students in the program. Amazing. We generate over $4 million a year in revenue. I did not realize that. Nobody, wow. Nobody realizes That's that. That's the uh, it's, secret. It's a, well, it's a huge program. It is. And it's a great program to create a bridge between the high schools and the community college. Exactly. And the better part about the program is what we're doing with those high school faculty. Because now we invite them to come to um, used to be all college, uh, professional development day. Right, so they, they can kind of see. They come in and they see us in action and they're just absolutely awed by what we do here. So they're constantly talking when they go back to their high schools about how great Suffolk is. And, and that's what we need. And they're promoting us. I always yeah. say we're like the best kept secret. Well, we, we always have been. We yeah, have been, and yeah. then as soon as people are here, they're like, oh, I get it. Yeah. How come I didn't know? Yeah, yeah. But it's get, the word is getting out. Um, looking back, is there anything you would do differently? In my career, the, the only thing I would do differently is I would have, um, I should have pursued the PhD. Okay. I should have completed that early on. That's uh, a daunting uh, degree, I think. But given the way I was going through college, where it was it's part time and everything's at night, and right. it, it was just too much for me to handle. Uh, yeah. I thought it was too big of a, a sacrifice for my family, so I. I was getting older and older. And I feel the same way. <laughs> so I, I, <laughs> the clock's I, ticking. I, I never got around to it, but I, I, I regret not doing that. I should okay. have done that. So whoever's watching this, Finish, start yeah, chipping yeah, away yeah, at it now. Yeah, chip away at your PhD, complete your education. Right. Get that terminal degree. Yeah. Which is a good use of terminal. Usually <laughs> terminal <laughs> is not positive. Okay. Now, I once saw this movie, and I've tried with varying degrees of success to do this with my family because you know you sit around when you are able to have family dinner and in the movie they said okay best worst and you had to say the the best part of your day and the worst part of your day now this is a little bigger it's not a day it's a career um, so I'm gonna ask you uh, about retirement okay. now well, that's easy what's the best what's the worst uh, well the best well, I always told people that it's George and Nancy time Finally. Um, finally, because everything we've done up to this point was either Suffolk County Community College, and you have to understand, when I was working at the college and raising my kids, on weekends, my family was in the lab with me, because I had to prepare um, test tubes and Petri plates. And, and I all remember sorts of your son saying that, yeah. that he vividly remembers yeah. that. When I was at Stony Brook, they were in the stacks with me when I was studying. Running wow. around through the stacks as I'm Xeroxing articles or whatever I needed for the next day. Or that horrible machine. What was that thing where the we had to... Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're going way back. <laughs> I try to say to students, you have no idea. No idea how bad it was. Yeah. No, and yeah. typewriters. And so, so my family was always... At, at, with you. With me at the college. Um, so the, uh, you know, the change you know, in terms of dedication... Yeah, so Nancy and I were always giving either to the college or focused on or our kids, kids or focused on, on our parents or whatever. Now we're to the point in our lives where it's important for us to focus on ourselves. And, and almost rebuild or and, get to know each yeah, other again. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. That's great. That's what, and it's great. 
Yeah. Now, what's the worst part? Because, you know, people do say it's a big adjustment. It really has not been a big adjustment for me. Great. It's, it's been absolutely wonderful. It's played out exactly as I thought it would play out. Oh, that's good. You know, I get, get up in the morning, I do my morning routine, I go to the gym, uh, I come home, I uh, cut the lawn or whatever, <laughs> you know, do, do the stuff around the house, and next thing you know, it's afternoon sometime. Right. Then we go out and do something in the afternoon together. Nice. Next thing you know, it's dinner time. So you, you, know, you go out to dinner or whatever. And You've earned it. It's just, it's just a wonderful time. It really so it's is. none of this, oh gosh, I, I can't stand being I'm not, tired. No, I'm not or, bored. That's good. I'm not bored. It's, uh, you know, we, we've traveled a little bit, uh, although we're primarily homebodies. We, yeah. we really love our But it doesn't sound home. like you had a, a lot of time to be homebody, so why not yeah, now? Yeah. It yeah, is and nice. so we're focusing on, on doing some, some work around the house that need, right. needed to be done that we can finally get done. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, so it's, retirement is great. All right, we'll so spread that word, too. Spread retirement that word. is yeah, great. Spread that word. Um, okay, now uh, we've been trying this new thing on Faculty Spotlight where we play the word game. Mm -hmm. um, so I say a word, and you just say whatever pops into your mind, and that's how we'll finish up. Mm, okay. Okay, you ready? Okay. Don't, don't peek. Okay. okay. Leadership. Challenging. Fun. 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 Life is fun. Every day is fun. There's the optimist. Yeah. Um, future. Future. Well, I'm really focused on my, uh, my grandkids at the moment. Um, my uh, granddaughter is going to get be married next next May. So we're, you have um, a granddaughter who's going to be married? So we're, I'm planning her wedding as we speak. Oh, wow. Uh, so um, that's exciting. Yeah, so I'm trying to get her focused on her career and her right. future. Uh, my grandson is uh, thinking about going into law enforcement, so he, he picked out a, a goal. So we're now we're preparing him for college. Uh, uh, so and that's that's really been my future. I mean, we're we're looking at the grandkids and trying to figure out how we can be most helpful to our to our grandkids. That's really that's so nice to yeah, hear. Yeah, that's good stuff. Last word, Suffolk. Suffolk. Love, I love Suffolk. And we know you do. It's really been a uh, an awesome career. You know, it's really been family for me. You know, it's it's just a a wonderful, wonderful organization. I and love you've it. made it family for me. Oh, good. So okay. thank you. Oh, you're welcome, Jenny. Thanks, George. Oh, thank you. Okay.